Hello. Hi. Somebody wants me done with my project this week, and everybody in my family thinks it's a holiday. <laughs> the whole week. The whole week. <laughs> yeah, the whole week. <laughs> Hello. 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 I woke up late. Hello. 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 Welcome to the meeting. Uh, yeah, welcome, Ejo, and Vahid, and Susan, and Dick, and Morgan. Uh, did anyone have anything they wanted to bring up in the meeting? Uh, uh, probably I can tell something. Okay. So, Bradley, I was actually going through your paper, uh, the last year paper, which names hypergraphs demonstrate uh, anastomosis during divergent integration. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting paper. I like I read about hypergraphs there, so there were two types of hypergraphs which I didn't know before. And I am from computational background basically, so I got to know more about biology and how like C elegance are so important, like 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 how we define bio biology into different parts and by using C elegance we can study human biology and diseases like Parkinson also. It was very fascinating to me. Well that's good, yeah. Yeah, we don't talk about that so much in the group, but it's it's definitely something they they model a number of diseases in C. elegans uh, and a number of different physiological processes. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely something you can follow up on if you know. There's a lot of literature on it. I don't know if it's something you're interested in, but whatever you're interested in. Um, yeah, and so yeah, that's good. Yeah, I see. Right, yeah, so. I see there were a bunch of your papers also, so I had a list of them, but I haven't gone through all right now. Yeah, please read those um, over if you, if you if you find something really interesting. It'll be helpful in terms of maybe what you might want to do in the group. So, yeah, you know, definitely background for it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So we had a number of people in the Slack where they were asking for, you know, they were asking about things. And I'm going to be putting up uh, some, I, I think we have some things pinned in the Slack channel, uh, first of all. So there are some resources in the, they should be pinned. If they're not, I'll make sure that they are. Uh, links to different things and, and we have onboarding guides and different places where we're doing work in, you know, like things like GitHub repositories and websites and things like that. So if people are interested in participating, you know, join our Slack and check out the pin materials. And uh, in the next few weeks, I'll be going over some of those things that we've been, uh, you know, that, that may be of use to getting oriented in the group. So that's good. Well, thank you, Mahul. Uh, yeah, yeah, I actually saw that. Yeah, Jihangmi has pinged a lot of things. Uh, PyG, DGL library, and few papers also. Hyperbolic. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll go through it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. So Vahid said, or Dick says, Vahid is making great progress on reconstruction of an image from lines taken across it. So did you want to talk about that a little bit or? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I'm uh, now just working on both this work and another work that we have been talking about regarding the uh, development of 302 or something. Oh, C302. Uh, yeah, the C302 project and it's uh, uh, how it could be connected to uh, Demovore. Uh, as we tried. Uh, yeah, I have, have done something on both of them uh, these days, and I can uh, talk about them. Actually, uh, regarding uh, the project, we uh, actually relate, relate to C elegance uh, that we, we, we have been, been uh, actually uh, we were discussing, uh, I guess, in an email that I've been sending to you uh, with Dr. Padre. Uh, listen, uh, we're uh, working on uh, actually uh, what we, we talked about uh, last week. Uh, we have something, uh, if 
because that would be very interesting and uh, that we could maybe uh, model or generate some models for uh, as a case study for the locomotion of silicons during different lower states, especially L1 to L4. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, from a developmental point of view would be really interesting. Uh, uh, so I'm trying to see if it is possible to uh, have different uh, abstract layers of, uh, of a project which we have in, in the open world called C2O2. Uh, in that project, uh, we are for something like four different layers for uh, modeling uh, neural networks of silicons which is uh, the, the, the difference between each layer is usually uh, actually related to uh, the uh, amount of data we have and especially the uh, we can say the, the dimension of the models we usually deal with uh, we from a, a molecular and cellular point of view to, to the most abstract layers like network layers we usually have different amounts of data. So we are trying to, C302, uh, this project is trying to uh, have different levels of complexity uh, and, and it's related model. So I'm, uh, I was trying to see if we could uh, do something like this uh, regarding the development yeah. of Seligas as well. So a stage of it would be possible to uh, have an abstract model for, uh, for example, um, L1, L2, L2, and L4, and an adult one. So, uh, uh, according to the paper we discussed last week, and also one more paper that uh, uh, I'm not sure if, if you have been presented or if you have been reviewed, that paper that the Padre uh, mentioned during our, uh, actually, when we're talking about this topic, uh, Bradley, have you ever covered the paper that Patrick mentioned? Mm -hmm. That was a great paper, I guess. Uh, there were um, um, something like eight different states of the CLDAS and every detail uh, data that could be possible, possibly included in that uh, in the model. I, I, I was looking uh, and I was summarizing the, the paper for our. For, uh, the draft that we were talking about. Uh, have you ever uh, covered that paper in, 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 uh, in the weekly sessions? I'm not sure. Which uh, paper is this? Refresh my memory. Uh, yeah, the paper that Padre uh, uh, sent us last, uh, actually, during the email that we were typing, let me uh, send one more this paper. That was a really great paper uh, regarding the development of syllabus. Uh, oh, yes. They, they are. Uh, the development of it's a data set of uh, development CLS with data from L, uh, I guess eight different larval states or eight different uh, time points. Yeah. States. Yeah. And a great data set. Yeah. 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 yeah I, and that's, I think that's what I had mentioned last week, but I couldn't remember the name of it. So, yeah, we can go through that real quick um, today. Uh -huh. And I think that would be good yeah, to see. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, that was a really great paper. And I was working on this paper. I, I actually summarized the paper for our draft we were working on. And also uh, the other project that Dr. Gordon mentioned, uh, I've been working on uh, actually the, the challenge that uh, he pointed out some weeks ago. And I've been going through the challenge, and that was a a great experience and some great work that we have been doing, doing actually to, to be able to do the image reconstruction. Uh, there are some overlap, I guess, uh, in the future between what we have done in the past. Uh, for uh, for some models, uh, some sort of approach. So uh, we can use some similar approach uh, during these uh, different projects as well. Yeah, I'm ready to discuss any of them. Well, that's great. Yeah, thanks for the update, Mahid. Yeah. Thank um, you. 
yeah, I'm glad to see that uh, the image classification processing stuff is moving along too. That's great. Uh, yeah, Susan, how about you? <laughs> You're muted. Oh. Yeah, you're muted, Susan. Can't hear you. Uh, things were... Anyway, um, my model didn't work, so I um, I found this reference, and so I printed it out, and it's a thesis. Okay. Mechanics and Flow of Biological Tissues, uh, 2023, December, so it's very recent. And it's got a lot of good points and, and nice references in it. Oh, great. Yeah. It's, anyway, yeah. So your thesis is uh, they want you to come to a close on it? or? Yeah. Um, it's I have to do a candidacy. It has to be sort of related to my thesis, but sort of a separate project. Oh, okay. So they want me to finish. And they to finish this, they want me to finish my final model. My final model doesn't want to finish. <laughs> <laughs> It, it um, console doesn't like it when you're, um, I don't know, strings, uh, ropes that are holding things together, holding things together when they when they go slack, mm -hmm. when they when they're yeah, it causes an error. And if it was a cell, it doesn't care or it uses that for growth or. It, it's not not relevant right. to a living cell, and the super program just gives me it gives me what was it six um, void equations. That was it. Hmm. Yeah, right good. where I have some strings, and I'm going, "Yep, they're sagging. It doesn't like it. Just." Hmm. <laughs> I'm so done with this program. <laughs> so sagging strings, that's the problem. I think so. It doesn't say, it just says there's void equations. It doesn't tell you why. Yeah. It says slackness could be replaced by buckling due to compression. I, I Yes, I tried that. I made them into rods. It still had six void equations. I added some more posts on the outside. Then it gave me five more void equations with it for a total of 11 void equations. So I took the post up. <laughs> just, okay. No. <laughs> no. It's, yeah. Well, good luck trying to fix it. <laughs> I don't know how to, I don't have any, because it's console, I don't have any advice. So. No, I, I want to use MATLAB. I just like. Them. Yeah. This is a void equation. It gives me an error message, and it says error number five three one four. You copy that, you paste it in Google, and it comes up with people's solutions to that error and what it is. And yeah, yeah. yeah. There's no help desk with with console, at least not the way they're doing it at the university. Yeah. Yeah. No one to ask. There no, there's no local community of people using Comsol, or is it just? I'm here out at the farm. This is my my room out <laughs> here in my living room, <laughs> and it's your family room. And so, um, I don't know anybody else using Comsol except the people from Comsol, and you ask them, and they say, "Well, you have to go through the university because that's the agreement." And you yeah. try to go through the university, and it takes a week for them to answer a question. Oh, wow. By then, okay. you may have solved it, or you may have given up and gone away, depending. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's impossible. I... Well, well, that's the only good thing about well-maintained open source, is that it's uh, usually they have some sort of community around it. Although sometimes yeah. it doesn't make that much of a difference, because... Uh, Depending on what you want to do, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, other people have problems like this. Yes. Yeah. But it just slows everything down. I mean, oh, I know. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm uh, at least six months uh, slow with this. So. Yeah. So he had a comment in the Slack here or in the chat. Uh, Mahul said, interesting analysis outcome in the paper above. And that's his paper here. Uh, with age, the brain becomes progressively more feed forward and discernibly modular. Short and crisp paper to read. And then Vahid gave a thumbs up. So, um, yeah, so that's great. Um, did anyone else have anything they want to mention before we start in the next thing? Uh, there is a related work in the progress to make data like these work available by the open worm, like this. Yeah, so this is actually, uh, let's see, this is the open worm reader. This is, yeah, this is a spreadsheet data reader from C302. So one of the things in open worm, because it's open source, and they're working on a lot of open source data sets and trying to get those uh, together, is they have a number of tools for pulling pulling data out of things like spreadsheets. And so this is, I guess, the this, I think, puts it into something like Neuron. I'm not sure what the details of this code are. But basically, that's how this, uh, you know, OpenWorm has a number of tools people have worked on like that over the years. So it should be interesting. Uh, I don't know. We don't get a lot of use out of them. Um, but, yeah. People have made tools like that. It'd be interesting to see, you know, what we could do with this, uh, with some some of the stuff we want to do here. We can utilize some of these tools. Okay, I'm gonna go on to that paper then, and so let me share my screen. There we go. Uh, so this is uh, a, this is from Nature. Daniel Whitfully is the head author. Uh, he's, he made the rounds a couple of years ago, presenting this paper in different places. And he in fact joined our Slack for a while, um, the Open Room Slack. Uh, Mei Zhen is another uh, scientist. I think she's at the University of Toronto. She does a lot of stuff with this. And uh, Steve Larson has talked to her about some of the data that they're things that they're doing. And so this is an interesting paper. We've got a lot of um, authors on this. Uh, the title is Connectomes Across Development Reveal Principles of Brain Maturation. And this is um, where they looked at, they're looking at the developmental connectome and they're looking at uh, the different larval stages and they're extracting data about the synapses. So if you're familiar with uh, C. elegans connectomes, or even if you're not, you know, you have the connectomes that we generally think of. And most of those connectomes are based on uh, like gap junctions. So the idea is that when, you know, they take micrographs of the, of the worm and they look for places where the cells connect. And they can actually mark those and then they've uh, created a list of connections from that. Uh, those are electrical connections. So that's one form of connectivity that you can have. Another form, of course, is chemical, and that comes from synaptic connections. The synaptic connections are a little tougher to, to characterize. They uh, emerge and disappear much, uh, you know, at a much higher rate than, say, like the physical connections. The physical connections are generally fixed. I mean, you know, you have like cells that come into contact, and you know, once you get to sort of the, I guess, the L1 stage, those are pretty much in place. But the uh, synapses, as you'll see in this paper, they change. Some of them are persistent, but some of them change. And some of them change in response to environment. Some of them change in response to developmental stage. And some of them persist uh, from a very, you know, across larval development. So this is a what we might call a sort of chemical connectivity. Uh, and this is an interesting thing because people haven't really characterized this a lot. So this is um, this is the paper here. So the abstract reads, this is what um, um, we were just mentioning. An animal's nervous system changes as its body grows from birth to adulthood and its behaviors mature. 
the form and extent of circuit remodeling across the connectome is unknown. So that's what I was talking about. It's remodeling with respect to synapses. Uh, so the circuits remodel, if you have synapses from cell A to cell B, if they uh, have a synapse, and usually the, sometimes the synapses are, you know, specific to a certain neurotransmitter. Sometimes they're more general. But, you know, this is this is what they're saying is all of this is unknown, really, in C. elegans. Um, here we use serial section electron microscopy to reconstruct the full brain from eight isogenic uh, C. elegans individuals. So it means that they have the same genetic background and, you know, that's it's from the same line uh, across postnatal stages to investigate how it changes with age. So this is these, these uh, you know, these four larval stages, L1, L2, L3, L4. Then they just took samples from each one and they're going to characterize the change across those stages. The overall geometry of the brain is preserved from birth to adulthood. So, you know, when it hatches right at the beginning of L1, that geometry of the brain is preserved. So those uh, gap junction connections, those electrical connections are more or less preserved. So this isn't changing too much. There's, you know, there's a little bit of, uh, well, I mean, there's no uh, change in that aspect of it. Uh, the, the cells don't migrate, for example. There, there are things that are, there's some morphogenesis postnatally, but that's usually not in the brain or in the, in the connectome. So the thing that is changing, however, are these synaptic connections. So that's what they're going to look at. Um, and then, so the overall geometry of the brain is preserved, but substantial changes in chemical synapse connectivity emerge on this consistent scaffold. So the synapses are the connections between cells. You have, uh, you know, these chemical connections and they may, you know, uh, disappear or appear or remain constant throughout development. Uh, comparing connect connectomes between individuals reveals substantial differences in connectivity that make each brain partly unique. So this kind of chemical connectivity changes across individuals um, and so this is where, this is why this is very interesting. Comparing connectomes across maturation reveals consistent wiring changes between different neurons. So even between two neurons, we have wiring changes uh, throughout development with the chemical uh, set of connections as opposed to the electrical connections, which don't usually see the, we don't usually see these changes. Uh, these changes alter the strength of existing connections and create new connections. So, you know, sometimes the, what the uh, synapses do is they augment or they tune, fine tune the electrical connections. So if two, two cells are said to be connected in the connectome in say like the, uh, in, a, in, a, in a little electric, we'll call it an electrical connectome, then there might also be synapses between those two cells but those synapses then can tune that interaction or tune that communication between the cells. You can also have synapse only connections, which can connect two cells that might not be connected in the connectome. So we've been working from a lot of different uh, electrical connectomes where, you know, we have the, the list of connections and some of those, you know, we don't, we understand those connections either exist or don't exist. But what this is doing is saying, well, maybe those connections are more fine-tuned. Maybe, you know, we have different grades of uh, strength of the connection over development. Maybe, you know, that connection is reinforced by having more synaptic connections or fewer synaptic connections. Or we might have new cells connected, and that's based much more on, say, the environmental context. So. Um, Collective changes in the network alter information processing. During development, the central decision-making circuitry is maintained, whereas sensory motor pathways substantially remodel. So this is really interesting. So in C. elegans, we do have a decision-making circuitry, and it's really, uh, you know, involves, like, say, go, you know, trying to find food or trying to find mates or, you know, navigating around their environment. And so those are all basically maintained. What changes a lot is, and you might expect this 
from what I just told you is that the sensory and motor pathways remodel quite a bit. So the pathways generating movement are going to remodel. The pathways generating sensory input, uh, like um, you know the sense of touch, those are going to remodel as well. And of course, you would expect that because in development we have a number of different uh, needs for this. So, for example, there I talked about last week the dower stage, which goes from L2 to L4, and it's this sort of um, you know alternative adaptive phenotype that some worms will uh, enter, uh, and so they have this they have these uh, 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 substantial adaptations in terms of their sensory pathways and of course their motor pathways because they're largely quiescent. Uh, so they have to do make a lot of changes with respect to that. Um, with age, the brain becomes progressively more feed forward and discernibly modular, as I mentioned before. That just means that you don't have a lot of feedback uh, through these synaptic connections, and you get these uh, specializations of function. Thus, developmental connectomics reveals principles that underlie brain maturation. So that's, uh, you know, they talk about a lot of these things here. Uh, and so this has a data set associated with it. So these are um, some of the data that we have available. Uh, so uh, all electron microscopy images and volumetric reconstructions are available at this site, bossdb.org project. And then connectivity matrices for all data sets are available at nematode.org and as supplementary tables. So they have supplementary tables and here you can download. I've actually worked with these data, so I've worked with the supplementary tables. So let's look at the data here. So this this uh, this is one of the data sets here. This is uh, with Vleet 2020, eight high resolution electron microscopy volumes of C. elegans brains at different stages of development spanning from birth to adulthood. So this is, uh, these are the data. So this shows kind of where they're getting their data. So they actually have here available uh, four volumes for L1, one volume for L2, one volume for L3, and then two for the adult. So you can see these little circles, that's the connectome volume. Uh, these data can be browsed at nemanode.org. Synapse metadata and segmentation labels are available here. So, you know, if you want to go in, you can find these. Um, so, yeah, this is basically, the, these are the instructions to do this. Uh, this is in a, you can do this in a Colab notebook or uh, on your own computer. You can basically do a pip install for this. And so it allows you to browse the data. Um, and so this is all got, you know, they, they did all this with a wild type hermaphroditic C. elegans brain. So this is the standard uh, wild type uh, brain that you might expect. Uh, and then they just did the different stages of development. They reared these in the same environment, so you don't have a lot of environmental variation. And then, you know, they, so the brain consists of 162 of the total 218 neurons at birth. So there's some more neurons that appear in the nervous system, but this is something that you get like in post embryonic uh, morphogenesis, but basically the brain itself is is all intact at birth. Uh, the you know there are other areas uh, where you get neurons like in the periphery, uh, and the 180 of the total 300 neurons in adulthood. So this is basically a subset of those neurons, as well as 32 muscles at all stages. So the brain, their brain, the way they segment it out, they have most of everything. They have muscles, they have neurons. Uh, each cell has been reconstructed, identified based in its unique neurite morphology and position, and had synapses annotated. So this is, of course, they were looking at the synapses, so they have the synapses annotated. Uh, so they have data set one. This has some information about it. Data set two, so they have many data sets that so they have eight. So, and then they give the position of these data sets, sort of where the volume is um, across these. So, yeah, this is cool. Uh, this is nice to have. Um, that, so that's what's available there on BossDB. And then uh, 
There's also nematode.org, or nematode.org, I'm sorry. And I'm not familiar with this resource. But, okay, well, let's see if you, AIY. So this actually gives you um, in network information. So this actually has information about the synapses and gap junctions. So gap junctions are the electrical connections. All right, you can see by the little icon. And those are here. So AWB and AIY have a gap junction connection, an electrical connection. ASG and AIY also. BAG and AIY have a, uh, an electrical connection, but they also have a chemical connection going in the direction of AIY to BAG. And then, you know, you have ASE, which has uh, chemical synapse, bidirectional chemical synapses, with also having an electrical connection. Now, you can also see the value added here because you have a number of different uh, chemical synapse only connections uh, AFD to AIY, AWC to AIY, bidirectional between AWA and AIY, and a couple other relationships. So that's really interesting information. So we can look up any neuron, and we know the neurons, like the neurons are well characterized. They have a nomenclature, so we can actually look at those connections by searching here. So that's another good reference. Um, and then, of course, this is uh, all scripts and, code and files used to generate all figures are available here. This is a GitHub repository. This is Daniel's uh, GitHub repository. This is for Nature 2021, and it has the, it doesn't have a readme in it, but, or, you know, it has like the data, figures, and tables. So the data here, this is just so, stuff that's been exported to NEMA node. So this, this should give you that same information. Right. So, um, the last page, uh, 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 in this page, if you open the, the archive, and you, can, you can see all the images and the data that they use with the, the GitHub report that you were actually uh, uh, you were, uh, describing. If yeah. you uh, reopen it, you can get uh, in, in the home page of the GitHub report. Yeah. There is a beautiful IPNB file that. Uh, uh, all these images and the data, uh, yeah, is the top of it, yeah. Okay, so that... Uh, yeah, this here, here, the, the general, the general, those figures that I can be... Oh, is, the, the notebook. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, that's a great okay. resource so, for, uh, for showing all uh, the data that which are available and all the figures which are available uh, for this one. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So this will give you every the volumetric models. So this is a yeah, this is the nerve ring volumetric model here and it just shows everything. And then connectome networks here, which are just, you know, nodes and connections, nodes and arcs. And you know, you can plot them all out in the uh Jupyter notebook or the I guess Colab notebook. Um yeah, this looks good. This looks good. So you can do experiments in here too. This is great. All right. Um, let's see, we had some things in the chat here. Uh, Mehul asked, does chemical connectivity, functional connectivity in brain, bold signal, and physical connectivity as SC in the brain? So, yeah, I guess you could say that, like, um, well, functional connectivity in bold is more about, like, correlations between voxels. Uh, and then, or I guess, like the, you know, you could uh, get like an, the anatomy of a brain network, and then effective connectivity is a little bit different. But basically, yeah, it's it's not quite the same thing because in it, with the bold signal, they're not measuring uh, synaptic connections versus like uh, electrical connections. But it's it's. Um, in terms of just kind of the network uh, abstraction, you know, that's that's it's kind of similar. Hard to really say, but um, yeah, as I mentioned, as an analogy, since you mentioned that chemical connectivity changes like FC, yeah, I mean there, yeah, there are going to be a lot more changes in the chemical connections. So yeah, I guess it could be a useful uh, um, analogy. So yeah, then Susan asked. 
the following reference is the thesis I was talking about. Yeah, A.S. Hernandez. Yeah, you sent this in an email, Susan, so I have it. Um, I don't want to talk about that next, but, uh, you know, we'll, uh, I'm not going to talk about the, the thesis, but we'll, t we'll talk about some papers you sent. That's okay. I was just, it's just a, a reference for references. Like the, there's some really good references in, in the thesis. Yeah. That's all. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So that, that's, I think that's enough on the, uh, Thank you for bringing that up, Fahid, the Whip Philippe paper. It was a very good thing to pull up. Um, like I said, this is really interesting work. Um, and there's a lot here that probably could be useful to understanding movement in uh, larval development, you know, kind of mining the data and saying, you know, what kinds of questions do we want to ask about it? Um, especially with some of the other papers that we have, like, you know, we, we've got a number of papers on the motor circuit. Um, you know, Neta Cohen and Eduardo Esquerdo, they've done a number of things on that. Just looking at the computational structure of that and sort of what's, you know, what's going on with the function. So there might be some interesting questions there. And then, of course, you know, we can, because we know the cells, the identity of the cells, we can get molecular data as well. And I, I I didn't pull that up this time, but I mean, it, it would have to be something where we'd have a specific question to ask because the molecular data is kind of like, you have to know kind of what gene you're looking for or set of genes you're looking for. Okay, uh, so let's transition over to this, um, the the Susan, what Susan was, uh, what she sent. And of course she's interested in a lot of the stuff on tension in cells and so she's got she sent me two papers she sent me that uh thesis and it's really long but it has a lot of good references in it but this is the first paper that she sent me that i really thought was really interesting so this is from current biology this is growth and tension and explosive fruit it's a very provocative title but basically it's about uh fruit in plants and it's the growth and tension in those uh, structures and then the explosion. So, you know, I think we've talked about this before where things can like explode. <laughs> they, they've used this and it's not really a metaphor because they actually do explode. But like what causes explosions and other types of nonlinear effects in tissues. It's, it's really interesting stuff. So this is the graphical abstract here. This is a plant. And the stem, you know, it's growing in there, these fruit, fruiting bodies here. Uh, so one, two, three, four. And so this is where they're exploding. They're releasing seeds. And then this is, uh, so these are the steps towards explosion. You have elongation, which is this step here, one. So the uh, fruiting body is elongating. And then two, you have widening. So the fruiting body widens. So it elongates and then it widens. And then three is where there's tension. So there's tension within the fruiting body. And then four is the explosion where it opens up, the seeds come out, and it rips apart. So if you look at this uh, legend here for stress, the maximum stress is red, the minimum stress is blue. So basically you have blue and the elongation step with these, uh, like these lines of maximum stress and then widening is where the whole uh body widens out but it you know it still has minimum stress except for these uh lines here and then in three you have tension so you have tension which is where there's tension building in the structure and then you know maximum in the middle here maybe minimum on the sides and moderate amounts of stress at the edges and then explosion where it releases that t that stress and it opens up and then you see there's minimum stress again so basically that's the what they're doing this is uh these are cross patterns of cellulose microfibre this is what's going on with the these individual cells so you have cell growth and then elastic contraction um so then um okay so in brief is how growth a stress relaxation process which is what they call growth. 
produces tension in exploding seed pods. And to them, it's puzzling. I guess as to most people. Mosca et al., which is the paper that they're referencing. So a lot of these papers will be like, you know, a lot of these type of papers in current biology where they they have papers where they introduce other papers. Uh, Mosca et al. find that a specific pattern of cell expansion regulated by microtubule dependent cellulose deposition leads to contractile tension. So as the cellulose is being laid down, it in increases the tension on or contractile tension on this tissue. Growth also has an active role in increasing tension on cellulose fibers and across lamellate cell wall. And so the highlights of this are that growth generates contractility, the pulling force in the fruit exocarp, switch in microtubule orientation underlies change in cellular growth patterns, cross pattern of cellulose microfibrils enhances contraction of growing cells, and multi-layer growth framework used to model cross lamellate cell walls. So let's see, a comment here. Okay, Dick has a comment. Survey of biological explosions. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, Dick Gordon wrote uh, paper 2018, Explosive Biopropulsion of Microorganisms. This is, I remember this paper. Uh, this is where I think you list like the different explanations. Yeah, talk. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, would you mind, or would you mind, I don't know, remember if you had, I think you gave the talk a long time ago, but um, I don't know if you'd want to re-give the talk, or you at least talked about it a while back. So yeah, this is, this is, this is good. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of interesting stuff on explosions in biology. So this is the paper here, Mosca, uh, Growth Intention in Explosive Fruit. They talk, they have this common, exploding seed pods of the common weed. Uh, Cardamine has, or Suda have the remarkable ability to launch seeds far from the plant. So that's why they have to do this explosion. The energy for this explosion comes from tension that builds up in fruit valves. And I know that Dick, in, in the stuff that he was talking about there, in that comment, you know, he's interested in this in diatoms. And diatom propulsion, you know, can be explained as kind of like an explosion. So there are different way, reasons you might have an explosion in the cell or in some cellular, uh, you know, multicellular colony or something like that, where you have this, you know, you, you can have this uh, nonlinear uh, transfer of energy. And that's, that's what it explosion is. And so basically, you know, it's a means for this plant to uh, disperse its seeds. And so they have, the, there's this uh, very, you know, elaborate uh, morphogenetic process that manages this sort of explosion. Uh, by explicitly defining the cell wall as a multi-layered structure in our model, we discovered that a cross lamellate pattern of cellulose microfibrils further enhances the development tension in growing cells. Therefore, the interplay of cell wall properties with turgor-driven growth enables the fruit exocarp to generate sufficient tension to power explosive seed dispersal. So that's an interesting paper. Um, then this other paper that Susan uh, sent me was a little bit different. It's not about explosions. It's about this, uh, so the title is Tension in the Ranks. Cooperative cell contractions driven force dependent collagen assembly in human fibroblast culture. So, this is where we have you know, uh, cell contractions that are coordinated across cells and it drives this force dependent collagen assembly. So, again, we have a graphical abstract. We have this uh, extracellular matrix structure formation by cellular retrograde poles. So, this uh, Basically, you have a bunch of cells and then generating this extracellular matrix. This is where the cells sort of reside when they're moving around. There is this extracellular matrix that is, you know, uh, provides sort of a means for them to move against and to interact with. And so uh, this is basically showing this process of this ECM structure by these cellular retrograde poles. So what they're doing, these cells are coming together. They're releasing these extracellular matrix precursors, 
and there's pull creating mechanical strain. So there's this forced environment already as the ECM is being formed. And then the membrane stretches and it organizes the bound ECM precursors. So there's this collagen and fibronectin, which result from this pushing and pulling, uh, or the, at least this pulling that's creating mechanical strain. It's creating these fibers that allow for the thing to, these ECM uh, precursors to form. So they align, concentrate, and polymerize across lines of force. So now you have this ECM structure that's this long fiber that's kind of joined to these two cells. It's formed of collagen and fibronectin. And this is coming, you know, from the, uh, from the cells. And the cells are creating force to cr generate these structures. So you can see that one of these structures, you know, some of these structures are identified in this, uh, in this microscopy image. In a close-up image, you can see that it's stained for fibronectin and collagen. And that's, that corresponds to this diagram here. So the highlights of this paper, uh, the kinematics of fibroblast motion were quantified. Five unique classes of retrograde poles, which is what this process is up here. By fibroblasts were identified, so they actually have different types of poles that exist in cell culture. Poles resulted in formation of fibril or fibro fibronectin and collagen in the extracellular matrix, and a new model for initial durable structure formation in animals is proposed. So again, these are just structures that you know exist outside the cells in the cell matrix. In cells, when they're coming together in a culture or in tissues. They're forming these all the time because they need them uh, for various reasons. And so they have to be strong and durable, but you know, they don't, you know, you can't just secrete stuff and let it self-organize out there in the in the world. The cells need to actively pull and shape this these structures together. So this is cool. This is another uh, so okay. Uh, the summary reads, uh, currently there are no mechanistic models that fully explain the initial synthesis and organization of durable animal structure. What that means is like, how do you get tissues to be the structure that they are? You can't just have a bag of cells. You need some structure, it's almost like a gelatin. You know, you need something to embed the cells in. Um, as a result, our understanding of extracellular matrix development and pathologies remain limited. Here we identify and characterize cell-generated mechanical strains that direct the assembly of the ECM. Cell kinematics comprise cooperative retrograde poles, which we saw, that organize and precipitate biopolymer structure along lines of tension. High-resolution optical microscopy revealed five unique classes of retrograde poles that resulted in the production of filaments. So uh, confocal imaging confirmed that retrograde poles can directly cause the formation of fibronectin filaments that then co-localize with collagen aggregates exported from the cell, producing persistent elongated structures aligned with the direction of the tension. So these structures are aligned with the tension between the cells as they're pulling apart. These findings suggest a new model for initial durable structure formation in animals and have important implications for the development of extracellular matrix. So yeah, that's another good paper. So thank you for that, Susan. Uh, we have another couple comments here. Uh, let's see. I don't know how to pronounce this word. Uh, Discobolicist and AIG ochromonas are preloaded. Or the algae, okay, algae ochromonas are preloaded. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. Contractions in axolotl cells and contraction waves are massive, 10 times the size of the, I guess, uh, yeah. And then nonlinear explosive contraction. I guess you could. I guess you could have that. Um, the ECM or basement membrane um, actually guides um, stem cells to turn into whatever cell type they're supposed to turn into. Yeah. They're, and working with the um, Tensegrity, I just got a paper and they had a um, Tensegrity model and it changed um, the way it mechanically moved according to how it was attached. 
it, it was uh, produce that J curve for you to change um, the stress strain from one value to another. So, um, well, ten segues tend to do that, but um, they were trying to emulate a, a cell, a single cell. Yeah. But it it makes a big difference the substrate that a cell is attached to and how it is attached. So um, that's why. That's why this is important. It's showing that um, contraction and tension are important in creating the basement membrane or the ECM. Yeah. And then that in turn affects the cells. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's good. That, that, um, that's the, my, why I was so interested in, in that paper. Oh, yeah. Actually, Showing ECM development. Yeah. Okay, that's all. Okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, then I have one paper that I added to this from some of the things. Uh, this is actually uh, interesting. This is something that I ran across in a seminar. So this uh, this is a paper called curvature induced cell rearrangement. And biological tissues. So this isn't forces necessarily, but this is sort of the topology of the cell. And so this is talking about curved surfaces and how that plays a role in uh, in morphogenesis. So this is from the Saunders lab, which is where they're working on these kind of questions. Uh, they gave a talk in uh, what, a seminar that I attended and they, they, that was really interesting stuff. So they're doing a lot of stuff with uh, sort of cell physics, cellular physics, and things like that. So if you go to the publications, uh, they have a lot of stuff on uh, different uh, positioning mechanics and symmetry breaking and uh, uh, some other, you know, molecular signaling stuff. So it's really diverse work. But this work here is on this phenomena of curvature induced cell rearrangements. So the abstract of this paper reads, on a curved surface, epithelial cells can adapt to geometric constraints by tilting and by exchanging their neighbors from apical to basal sides, known as apical basal T1, which is AB to T1 transition. So this is actually, uh, you know, this is something that they're naming. Uh, I think it's in mammals. I'm not really sure what the mo model is. Eh? Uh, but anyways, the relationship between cell tilt, ABT1 transitions, and tissue curvature still lacks a unified understanding. So basically, you have epithelial cells. You have this curved surface. They're adapting to the geometric constraints of that curved surface by tilting and exchanging their neighbors from basic apical to basal sides. And so that's what this transition is and all those dynamics. Uh, and so we don't really understand why this works or how it works. Here we propose a general framework for cell packing in curved environments and explain the formation of ABT1 transitions under different conditions. We find that steep curvature gradients can lead to cell tilting and induce ABT1 transitions. So this, depending on the curvature gradient that you have, you have you can have increased cell tilting or limited cell tilting, and it can induce these transitions. Conversely, large curvature and isotropy can drive ABT1 transitions by hydrostatic pressure. So you can actually have this sort of curvature. If the curvature is large enough, you can have hydrostatic pressure playing a role in some of these transitions as well. The two mechanisms compete to determine the impact of tissue geometry and mechanics and optimize cell arrangements in 3D. So this is, uh, they kind of talk about this. Uh, so the ex as the external surface and barriers in many organs, epithelial tissues have to mechanically adapt to their environment. And so, you know, if we look at cell shape in two dimensions and three dimensions, it reveals insights into how cells pack 
and undergo rearrangement during epithelial tissue formation. So there's a lot of packing uh, dynamics and rearrangements going on. And we talked about some of these epithelial sheets and what they looked like a couple weeks ago. But, you know, that, that was just kind of a, a straight line sort of set of examples. If we add curvature, then we have another set of examples to work from. So this is where, you know, we have uh, these cellular dynamic processes like division and apoptosis and rearranged cell neighbors. These are what they call T1 transitions or the exchange of neighbors without altering the cell number. So you can have these different types of, um, you know, exchanges without having more cells packed into the same locate into the same volume. Uh, T1 transitions are important in mediating plantar tissue dynamics. For example, oriented T1 transitions can lead to tissue elongation or flow, and the energetic barriers for T1 transitions to occur can dictate tissue fluidity slash solidity. So again, it can determine like how loose or packed the tissue is. So there are a lot of things here, a lot of interesting work in this paper. Um, I don't know, I don't want to really go through it that deeply, but uh, I don't know. In light of the other two papers, I think it's interesting. Let's see. Okay, so yeah, have analogous curvature literature for cell membranes. Okay, yeah. So um, that's good. Uh, yeah, I did, actually did want to mention one more thing before we go. Uh, and this is something that Morgan kind of brought my attention to, but something that came in my inbox this morning, too. Uh, this is the A-Life newsletter. This is something that the, um, the Professional Society for Artificial Life, they put this out on a regular basis. And they always have some really interesting stuff in here. Uh, one thing I did want to talk about was this uh, point here. Um, so this is something reflecting back on artificial life, but way back, like 25 years ago. So we've talked about like open questions in artificial life and things like that. And, you know, it's, it's an area where people have been doing a lot of work simulating life, simulating biology. But there are these open questions that sort of, you know, the field started as sort of a set of broad open questions, and they really haven't really been answered yet. So this little piece here uh, reads, what value does artificial life with its decades rich history of research, diverse range of methods, and ever growing focus and interest bring to the scientific community at large? Let me bump this up. Okay, so this is kind of what we're, you know, what we've always kind of asked about our fields. Uh, what, how does it advance our knowledge? Should we think about artificial life as its own discipline? that tries to identify and understand new problems or give us new ways of thinking? Uh, do we instead just see the methods that we use as a means of inquiry to existing problems? Or perhaps, is artificial life just an excuse to be creative and wacky all in the name of scientific advancement? So there is a lot of stuff that's kind of like, well, this looks cool, let's write it up. But it doesn't necessarily answer any biological questions. So, I mean, that, that artificial life has had that problem I don't know if it's a problem, but that's that's the way they've kind of approached it sometimes. So, you know, this this problem doesn't isn't something that's just happening because the field is, you know, uh, because people can submit papers and uh, it's it's something that people really kind of wondered about from the start. So there is no there are no easy answers to this question, of course. This is why at ECAL ninety nine, which is the conference in nineteen ninety nine, this was the European conference in artificial life, a debate was held with some of the field's most prominent researchers over these very questions. So A-Life started at the Santa Fe Institute in about 1987, or at least the first conference was held there. And they had a bunch of like, you know, interesting topics, we're, we're kind of right from the start. And, you know, their focus was sort of on the origins of life, sort of simulating life, simulating evolution. And it kind of went from there. But you know, by the time 1999 rolled around, you know, people wanted to take a reality check and maybe think about, you know, what what are what are the where is our where are we going with this? And so, um, 
this is a paper uh, by Jason Noble, Seth Bullock, and uh, Ezekiel DiPaolo. And they published a report on this debate. This took place 25 years ago at ECAL 1999. And it's still a relevant conversation today as it was then. So this is a three-page paper, three-page report. And this is in the journal Artificial Life from spring of 2000. Uh, Artificial Life Discipline or Method report on a debate held at Decal 99. And so, you know, this is one of the things they publish in Artificial Life. They publish these um, sort of reports of different events at the conferences. Because the conferences are a very important part of that community. So uh, basically, they have to start with the question, how can artificial life advance scientific understanding? Is artificial life seen as a new discipline or as a collection of novel computational methods that can be applied to old problems? And given that the products of artificial life research range from, range from abstract existence proofs to working robots to detailed simulation models, are there standards of quality or usefulness that can be applied across the whole field? So this reminds me kind of the Open Norm Foundation where we're doing like, you know, we do stuff with robots, we do stuff with computational modeling, with data, and then, you know, simulation models. So there's this very wide range of methods. Uh, so they talked about this. Uh, we started by sketching a continuum of approaches to uh, artificial life as a science. At one extreme, there are researchers who use techniques such as genetic algorithms, and animat style simulations. An animat is a sort of an, an analogy of an organism. So it's not an animal, it's an animat. And it might be some like model of an organism. It could be very simple or it could be more complex. So these are techniques that people used back then and they still do today. But you know, that's one way you can approach problems is by simulating the biology in different ways. Typically, the problems come from within biology. The work of Catano and colleagues on morphogenesis and Drosophila is one example. We see the work as exemplifying the idea of AL as a method or as a collection of methods that could, at least in theory, be put to use by investigators in many different fields. Okay, so that's one extreme. But the other extreme is the view that artificial life opens up a whole new way of thinking. That is, it's a discipline in itself. An example of this is Ray's work on Tierra, which is a, an artificial life platform. I don't know if it's still supported, but um, that Ray and some other commentators have taken to raise fundamental issues about what it means to call a system alive. If the existence of the continuum is granted, two questions are raised. First of all, and so this continuum is from like, uh, you know, sort of these techniques to look at existing problems and the other end of the continuum are these methods uh, or, or having a field in and of itself answering questions within that field. So basically, it's either applied biology or it's its own thing. Uh, two questions are raised. First of all, uh, are, all possible, uh, are all possible positions along it tenable? So is it a true continuum or is it just kind of two approaches to... In, you know, to a problem. The skeptic might ask whether computer simulations of the kind developed by AL, AL researchers ever add anything to existing formal methods and disciplines like biology. So do we, are we adding anything to biology by simulating it? And, you know, people have different opinions about that. I think a lot of biologists, uh, biologists aren't necessarily always on board with this. So if you present this to like, uh, you know, biology group, they may or may not think it's useful. Uh, definitely like to, to other groups like to uh, bioengineers or to uh, computer scientists, they love this stuff, but maybe not so much uh, for, you know, depending on what area of biology they're in as well. It might be very useful. At the opposite end of the spectrum, one might be cynical about the possibility of objectively studying life as it could be. Okay, so, you know, maybe we don't want to know uh, about life as it could be, or maybe it's too speculative to say stuff like that. But in, you know, artificial life, we can answer a lot of questions about evolution, about alternate forms of organisms, about things that don't exist in the biological world, 
Um, and so this is important in the era of bioengineering, where we can create different types of uh, mutant organism, or you know, we can uh, engineer genomes to do certain things. We would like to know what those things look like before we design them in a biological instantiation, or even what might, you know life might have looked like a billion, you know, a billion years ago. Yeah, which we don't really have fossil remains for, or our fossil remains are uh, tenuous at best. So having those kind of models are useful. Um, and, you know, I could mention that, you know, in open worm, we try to simulate C. elegans. Um, you know, C. elegans is pretty well characterized, but we could simulate behaviors that you might not see in the lab because you just simply don't have the methods in the lab to get, get at some of these behavioral modes. So. Uh, those are all things. Uh, the second question concerns quality. How can we distinguish good work from bad? The two questions are not independent. If one sees AL research as some kind of thought experiment, one's quality criterion could well differ from those of someone who is interested in more or less precise models of real world systems. So, you know, you, some people present thought experiments. And thought experiments are useful in the sense that they pose problems better. They give us a sharper sort of refinement of a problem, or they give us maybe an avenue to go down later. Uh, but some people like precise models. They like sort of hyper-realistic models. They like, you know, everything to be defined. And in some systems, you can do that very well, like C. elegans. In other systems, you can't. And so this is the problem that we've had. Sometimes questions are bigger than like anyone, um, especially like theoretical questions, about say like life or you know cross species comparisons where you can't do these kind of precise simulations so this is the tension in this field and so uh, that's all I'll talk about for that I thought it was an interesting set of issues that were raised and you know even though that debate happened in 1999 it's still relevant today Fahid? <laughs> uh, uh, actually I was going to discuss one more paper that uh, I was uh, actually dipping into uh, during the, the last week. Uh, there's one great, um, a great paper. What was the paper about? <laughs> okay. Uh, the paper let me uh, the paper is something uh, related to what we are talking about. Uh, as we said, we are going to uh, consider both the molecular or cellular uh, aspects of the development of CLRs for the case study we are going to deal with locomotion uh, and also the structural properties of the development. So uh, actually uh, most of the papers and uh, the work so far uh, have been talking about the structural properties of the development of CLRs, for example, different wirings and how different cells and neurons are uh, related uh, to different larval states, uh, and uh, and if you see my, let me share this window again. Can you see this window? Is it okay? Uh, I'm not seeing anything. Or not yet. No, not yet. Well, not sure what this is happening. But uh, regarding to what you what we were representing uh, and, and, and the main paper we were talking about uh, during different larval stage we have in, in the figure three, figure three part C, you can see that we have from L1 to the adult one, we have uh, maybe five different categories of cells like or behavior, like you can say motor output, body movements, and, uh, and also uh, the interneurons are uh, are three categories that are three modules that are uh, during L1 to late L1 uh, are actually uh, being uh, considered. But when we go through the L3 and L uh, stage, we, we can see that two or three more structural modules are being added uh, to the uh, to what we can say from an engineering point of view different dimensions of our um, uh, modeling system. But uh, there are only structural properties. From 
a molecular SL lover or you if we also have some uh, new uh, we, we might have some uh, new uh, features or uh, added to the model so I'm trying to consider uh, those features as well the paper that I was going to uh, to uh, sorry, mention uh, is a model of a biological model of a whole cell uh, and also a network of whole cells. Uh, we can say at least two neurons can be, or two cells could be connected to form a network. So, from that point of view, this could be actually the least possible uh, consideration for a developmental uh, modeling, uh, we can say. So, I'm both. I was also working on this aspect and to be able to uh, consider when, when when we are trying to model uh, the structural uh, development, uh, we could also, or actually as a question, could be also consider the molecular and cellular aspects as well because uh, the data is usually, usually lack data for such uh, studies. So I'm trying to add those features as well and see if we could uh, work on this as well. Yeah. Well, hello, Hussein. <laughs> uh, yeah. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah, that sounds good. I was looking actually at the uh, figure three of the paper and yeah, so basically, see if I can share my screen here. Um, so this is what uh, he was talking about you have this graph where you have the different developmental stages in the adult, and then you have cells per module, so it's the counting up the cells in each module, and you have these modules listed here, and basically you get new modules emerge as you like get through development. So in the L1 worm, you have three modules, and in the L2, you have, uh, I guess it starts to become four modules in L1, in L2, we have four modules, and then five in L3, and then that persists into adulthood. So that's, and then this all fits into sort of this network of sensory, motor, interneurons, and then modulatory neurons. So you have this network of the four types of neurons, or the four functions of neurons, um, in both feed forward and feedback. So the other thing they mentioned in the paper is that these feedback mechanisms kind of shut down uh so you 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 know the feedback mechanisms are used sort of to maybe you know as a supervisory mechanism and to like training wheels until you get some of these other modules in place and then you can have a feed forward network that's more uh adult like but also has more modules or more functional subdivisions and so they show the proportion of synapses here so you can see that you have feedback decreasing it decreases isn't that much. So, I mean, you know, it's not like there's no feedback in the adult worm. It's just less. And then you have uh, this feed forward that goes up. So the number of feed forward synapses goes up. So it's definitely consistent with this graph here. So, yeah, if you could send the, like, the citation for that paper that you were just talking about, that would be good. Um, and it would be, uh, you know, that might be something to follow up on. Uh, definitely, you know, we can do modeling on this stuff. Uh, we just have to figure out, you know, how, uh, to put the data together and what makes sense to put it together. Okay. Actually, the, the data, uh, the second place I was talking about, uh, is not related to the elemental, uh, modeling as you were talking about. What we are actually interested in is usually, uh, on this study is how to how we could uh, uh, look at the war from uh, during different larval stages and how different compartments are going to be added to the model. Uh, the work I'm interested in uh, and related to my previous work is that if uh, molecular and cellular mechanisms are also uh, uh, I, I, added the link to the chat to the paper like this. This is not, actually this paper is not going to be uh, part of the developmental modeling, but some similar work to this is going to be 
uh, considered. I'm saying that uh, if we are trying to see a behavior from molecular to structural compartments, uh, uh, some some work like this is going to also be considered, and uh, different uh, molecular and, cell and cellular uh, mechanisms are also going to be uh, considered uh, for such a study. In addition to structural uh, properties of, of the model. Yeah. So this is the paper: biophysical modeling of C. elegans neurons. And so what you're saying is that there's a they have a compartmentalization strategy for this. Okay, yeah, this looks good. Sorry, I guess uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not having your voice clearly listening to oh. my video. Okay, well, well yeah. So, yeah, I just said that this looks good and this will be a good addition to this kind of work. So, yeah, I mean, you know. I don't think people have really mastered yeah. the methodology here, so anything you can bring to it would be good. Okay. Well, thank you. So. Yeah, thank you, Vahid. Uh, so anyone else have anything they need to get off their chest before we go? <laughs> Comments? I'm good. Okay. All right. So, well, thank you for meeting. Uh, if you have any questions, please follow up in the Slack or email or whatever. And see you next week. Thank you. Bye. 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 See you. Thank you, see everyone. You. Yeah, thank you. Bye.